Dear Rudy, thanks for responding to all your patrons all the time, no matter how dumb and silly the questions are. You're welcome, by the way. I only played Magic for about a year, but I'm obsessed with the finance side of Magic. I don't get involved in the sealed booster box investing or old cards or reserveless cards like you since I don't have the money yet. But I'm trying to build up my cash flipping new cards from the standard era boxes. So backstory. I purchased 200 smothering titties from rep smothering why I totally sorry but I totally ruined the name of that card for so many people smothering tithe from Ravnica Allegiance we're calling it tithe for now on that's the new word from Ravnica Allegiance for around two dollars fifty cents three dollars fifty cents each and I made a lot of money selling them for about nine dollars each locally and on eBay wow two hundred of them for about three bucks a piece to nine. Wow, you definitely probably tripled your money, even doubled if you factor in fees if they're all online. All right, good job. I already know where this is a story, you can tell. So, with all the hype of War of the Spark, I decided to go bigger. I bought 450 copies approximately of the new Elder Spell card from War of the Spike. War of the Spike. War of the Hype. I feel this is going to be the next $10 rare. I paid about $6 per card for the Elder Spell. And now every day I check the price and it's dropping in price every single day since the release when I bought the card. I feel trapped and I don't know how to move forward with my four to 500 copies. Am I just simply screwed for being a Timmy? What would you do at this point in time? How would you adjust strategy moving forward based on what's happening? Thanks, Mike, AKA Timmy. All right, so uh, a couple things we need to talk about here, everybody. We're going to start with the very simple basic premises first. Number one, this is a classic situation of a Wall Street gambler gone wrong. Happens all the time with options traders, hashtag, you know, Wall Street bets on Reddit. That's, I love that. That's my favorite subdivision area. The Wall Street bet people are famous for it. What happens is when you get, you get a few good lucky hits... All of a sudden, you, you, you feel confident, almost a little cocky. You feel special. You feel like you got it under control. So you raise, you kind of push it up. You push the envelope. You raise the, the stakes. So then what happens, because you got a couple right. So then you go bigger. You make another bet. And eventually, Wolverine hairstyle Rudy here to tell you, you get pounded in the face. Chuck Norris rings your doorbell. You think you're getting pizza. Or you think you're getting food delivered and he just punches you in the face and walks away and you don't even know what happened. So this is a classic story of somebody hitting it, feeling confident, going back for more, and they get wrecked. So unfortunately, we've talked about this before, everybody, as far as gambling, investing, and even Wall Street and doing options trades. What happened here is the guy made some money. Now he's going back, he raised up the stakes, like we said, and now he's losing 10 times the amount he made the first time, giving him an overall net loss. This is very common in the business world, Wall Street, when people buy individual stocks, bonds, even options trading, equity, anything. This is a very common mindset, especially with gamblers, with scratch-offs and lottery things. So, he, he's pretty much saying, Rudy, at this point in time, what would, what do we, what would we do? What do, we, what do you recommend? Look, uh, the first thing that stood out to me is you've only been in the magic world for about a year. So you're not super familiar with some of the most basic trends of when new sets come out and pretty much the erosion of price and the rush, you know, for people to dump their cards and the race to the bottom and all these fancy little slang terms that happen with every release of every new Magic set. So that's the first thing that stood out to me. He didn't have a lot of experience with a lot of Magic releases over the years. This gentleman specifically stated, War of the Spike... I mean, <laughs> I'm going to call it War of the Spike for now on. War of the Spark hype continues to be so astronomically high, there's just money sloshing around everywhere. And with the fact that distributors and stores are not just pumping out boxes because of allocation period, this gentleman thought the supply squeeze was going to continue to push up the value of a particular card he felt was going to be either strong and standard, maybe it's going to be the next some Commander EDH staple, maybe it's going to turn into the reserve list, next Pokemon Charizard, Char Lizard with Pikachu something. I, I don't know what he was expecting. But clearly he thought, based on the scenario of hype, emotion, lack of supply, that it was going to be the next rare to spike. And hey, maybe it still happens. Maybe this video is premature. Maybe in the next 30, 60 days, it goes 10, 15, 20 dollars and becomes the next Assassin's Trophy at 20, 30. To... Oh wait, what? That card tanked too? Never mind, that card tanked too. So, you know, I, I understand his perspective. 
The problem is he didn't seem to fully understand what really happens with these magic releases. And I know I'm a broken record on this topic, but it really just, you know... I've been Wolverine haircut style Rudy many times in the last couple years. Where I just don't bathe, I don't take showers, I don't get haircuts. We don't have time for that. That's for people who have extra time in this world. They're not hustling. They're not working 24 hours a day. You know, and he didn't realize the risks that he was taking. I don't know what, I mean, what's he going to do at this point? I mean, literally, I, th I just checked before I filmed the video. That card is at about $1.50. The Elder Spell is at $1.50. He's got a cost basis around 6 so not even including selling online with shipping and fees and associated with just the cost of moving an online transaction, he's already down 75%. He's almost looking at a full 90 plus percent loss if he has to sell online with shipping and fees. I mean, at that point, if you had a 90% loss, you might as well just keep the cards. You want my advice right there? If you cannot unload these locally for maybe 2 $3 a piece, at least get half your money back from your $6 cost basis, you're at the point where you're already so deep you know, if you're, unless you're leveraged, I'm, I'm hoping you're not leveraged on a credit card or anything silly, which I feel like just because I said that, it's going to spark more people to send me stories and comments on different things to do future videos. Uh, apparently, people really like this style. So, based on what's going on with that, honestly, if you can't sell it online, or I'm sorry, locally, I don't think I would be selling them online for $1.40, $1.50, $1. sixty, and walking away with 50 cents or a quarter. There's just no point in that anymore. I mean, you're already in too deep. You've taken the loss. Keep the cards and move on. Maybe you'll get lucky and it spikes, maybe you won't. Maybe it just flatlines at 50 cents to a dollar, and that's it. Stuff like this happens all the time. When I did mass box openings with, you know, Battle for Zen, Oath of the Gay Watch, Eldritch, Shadows, even some of the master sets back in the day, all the way to before Kaladesh, you know, all these old blocks, when I did that, that happened all the time. I'd get orders that would come through saying, Rudy, I want to buy 75 of these rares, 60 of this rare, 100 of this rare. And then, you know, as I got smarter, I put circuit breakers on my eBay account where I would only list up to 8 or 10 at a time. And then when it sold out, I would relist and do a price check every 8 to 10. So, I get it. I've seen speculators do this for years. It's always been that way in Magic. It's a lot of fun. A lot of people get a rush out of it. it gives you that kind of that gambler's premium feel. It gives you that nice gambler's feel. That rush. That endorphin kick in. That dopamine hit. I mean, I, I get it. It's fun. But this gentleman's tone was in a situation where it felt like... He was genuinely concerned about losing all this money because he commented at the beginning of the message stating he wanted to move up to doing reserve lists, sealed box, a lot, a lot of more, as I like to call it, more of the blue chip style, mutual fund style investing of the magic world. He wanted to move up to the bigger asset classes to kind of hold those bigger shares for the long game, which is, real, which is always where the real wealth is always going to be made in Magic the Gathering, period. I've got some really cool videos coming out soon where I'm going to show some cool things you guys are going to love about the long-term wealth of this. And it's not really talked about because, again, it's not fun. It's boring. Being long-term, setting it and forgetting it, it's lame. It doesn't have that sexiness. It's not attractive. When I go out to the nightclub at Taco Bell, I mean, you know, I don't walk around saying, Hey, look at this. I'm holding this Magic the Gathering booster box for 10 years. And all the employees don't jump over the counter and give me hugs. It just doesn't happen. It just, it's not attractive. It's not a sexy thing to do, everybody, to play the long game. It's boring and it's lame. I get it. The fun, rush, dopamine, endorphin hits is always going to be from flipping the new cards, that quick hit. You wake up the next day. The chart has that huge spike up, that huge gap up. We all love that huge gap from $2 to $10. I just want to use the word gap. Giggity. Two Gs. And I mean, but that's the reality of it. It attracts a lot of the amateur investors, the Timmies the lower income individuals and they're playing inside of a field and they're trying to make money at something that incurs a lot higher level of risk than something that someone like me would do. I don't engage in stuff like that. You know, hey, I'm known for the most famous thing from two years ago. I'd rather buy a hundred bizarre Baghdads for, you know, I paid between $600 and $800 a card, which at the time was really expensive. You know, so I have a cost base of around like $680 right now in bizarre Baghdad and I have a massive position. And see, for me, it's boring because they've just been sitting locked up in a huge vault since then. But for me, there's not a lot of risk in that position. It's just going to slowly do its thing and get older. But these new standard, but the cost, the kind of that barrier entry, that high dollar amount, keeps out most people. So I wanted to share this story with everybody because I just, I think it happens a lot more than people realize. And I feel like because of these videos, more people are going to continue to come forward with stories that I can share with everybody. I'll try to do some of these stories every once in a while, but I just hope you guys learn something from all this because it is very important to realize the risks.